glad to be back with you this evening. Uh, Maxine, where are you sitting? I got, there you are, right here in front of me. Hi, Maxine. Uh, I just hold on, I'll get back to you in a moment. But how many of you have older brothers or sisters? Let me just see your hand, Fifth. <laughs> many of you know my story enough to know that I'm the baby of my family. By the way, how many babies in the family do we have present? We're kind of special, so I like to hold them around. Um, and, and Mama had uh, nine children. Two of them died in infancy, and then seven more of us. So I was the baby of a lot of, uh, 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 of the family and a lot of siblings in the family for, that, uh, for our family. So here's my other question. This is kind of a gut question for some of you, I know. But how many of you that are, had older brothers and sisters sometimes, sometimes felt compelled to tell on them? <laughs> yeah, I just, somehow it would just come all over me like mom needed to know what my brother Bud had done. And, and I just felt like that I needed to do that. I knew that she would send him out to get a little limb off the tree and she would use it on him. But still, I felt it was my responsibility. You understand what I'm saying? Well, Maxine, I feel a little bit that way about my brother Scotty Killings. Scotty Killings. So I'm going to tell you a quick story because it's a true story. Uh, he called me five or six weeks ago and, and he said, I I'm kind of feeling like I'd like to take a little vacation. Could you come sometime in October and preach for me? I said, well, Scotty, I, I don't have a Sunday available until uh, in early November. And it's a pause there for a moment. And then Scotty said, well, he said, let's just, could you come? Could you come just before Thanksgiving? Because he said, true story. They don't listen then anyway. <laughs> Can you believe it? I'm on the phone talking to him. I said, now let me get this straight, Scotty. You're asking me to come on the weekend before Thanksgiving because nobody listens anyway. <laughs> now I'll tell you, he didn't mean that. But I thought it was my duty, Maxine, to report on my brother, Scotty. I love old people. And I just love Scotty. All right. Now, oh. uh, with that in mind, oh, let me tell you something serious uh, from, uh, because some of you will know this gentleman. Um, they've come to a church here for some time now and uh, live down in the, in the clever area. Uh, but, but Tom... Ottendorf, there you go. Tom Ottendorf and Linda. Tom passed away, and uh, and he's a very friendly man. Owned uh, a lot of the quarries around, and some of you will have known him. But he's one of the friendliest men I've ever known. I'll have his service tomorrow at the First Baptist Church in Clever, at eleven o'clock in the morning. And uh, I know when I talked to Linda, he really loved coming to the Cowboy Church, and so I just wanted you to pray for that family, if you will do so. It's been quite a few years ago that something was spoken from out in space that became part of the language of our culture even till today, although now it's often used uh, in humor. But it began like this. Houston... <laughs> Most people get it just from that single word. Houston, we have a problem. Now you all probably remember, that's Apollo 13. And there were those three fine astronauts that were on their way to a moon landing. And they had a little problem when it came to the separation of the first booster rockets, but they made it past that. And they were about 56 hours, almost 56 hours into that mission, and something that was pretty catastrophic happened. And there was a fire, and there were oxygen tanks that blew up, and suddenly what seemed to be a uh, somewhat routine, routine trip became critical. And they Im immediately said, in fact, the exact words that they said is, Houston, we've had a problem here. We've had a problem here. Now here's what I want to ask you. If Jesus himself were here today, and he was looking at America, would Jesus say, we've got a problem here? Amen. I want to talk to you tonight about that. In fact, I'll tell you right now, and I don't always do so, the title of my message tonight is Problem Solved. Problem Solved. But I want to start with the first word of that, and that's the word problem. I've lived long enough to know that in America we have a problem. There is a tendency within our culture that is downward and it's accelerating. Could you agree with that? Amen. I think it was 1995 that uh, a writer who was at one time considered for the Supreme Court, Robert Bork was his name, 
wrote a book and it was entitled Slouching Toward Gomorrah. Quite frankly, I never read the book. I'm not sure it was a particularly good book from what I read in the reviews. But the title always intrigued me. Slouching Toward Gomorrah. And it was a book about what was happening in 1995 from his perspective in our country. I believe that if he were still living today, he died, I believe, in 2012 at age 85. But I think that if he was still living today, he would rename his book Sprinting Toward Gomorrah. <laughs> that we have a problem in our country and that problem is rapidly taking us away from God and away from His will and toward the judgment of God. Amen. Yeah. That's where we're headed. But I want you to know there's hope. But before we look at that hope, we're going to look at the problem. So if you have your Bible tonight, we're going to open those Bibles or open your uh, iPhone or iPad or whatever you have, and we're going to go to Romans chapter 1. Many of you are going to be very familiar with this because in Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3 especially, the Apostle Paul says, People, we have a problem. We have a problem. And he starts off with the Gentiles. So most of his readers who were Jews would have been saying, Amen. Amen. Those Gentiles, they've got problems. But you all know because you've read your Bible, he didn't stop there. And before he's through, he said, Hey, wait a minute. The Jews have problems also. And in fact, he said, We've got the same problem. And you all know what that problem was because by the time you get to Romans 3.23, and we're going to be in chapter 1, but by the time you get to Romans 3.23, the Bible says, and Paul says very clearly, all have sin. Come on, church. All have sin. And fall short of the glory of God. We've got a problem. And the problem is not new. It's as old as Eden. And the problem is sin. And that sin separates us from our God. And God is a God of holiness. And we move and are moving away from Him. Now, in Romans chapter 1, I want us to begin with verse number 18. And we're going to follow through from there. But just read along silently in your Bible as I read in mine. The Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Now we can stop right there already and say, people, we have a problem. And Paul's spelling it out here. Verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, 
backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And I say, America, we've got a problem. We've got a problem. And the problem and the and the, the, the slouching toward Gomorrah that is a part of that is clearly outlined in this passage of Scripture. I'm hoping you'll keep your Bible open. Because what I want to do is I want to show you in this word, this slippery slope, this that happens in any culture when they begin to turn their back on God. So I'm just going to show you about six different steps that are here. And they're not necessarily sequential, but they're certainly there in the text. And we won't take a lot of time with them. But here's what I want you to do. As I share this with you, I want you to be asking yourself two questions. Two questions. One, is this what we're seeing in America? Secondly, is any of this being seen in me? You understand? Because I'm going to tell you, sometimes our conscience is only able to identify the sin in someone else's life. When the truth of the matter is, it's designed by God to reveal the sin in our own life. So I want us to look at two things. I want us to look at, is this what's happening in our country? And secondly, is it what happened in my own life? And perhaps in my home and family. And then we'll come to the solution because the title of the message is Problem Solved. So here's what happens. You got your Bible open? Verse 18. Number one, we suppress the truth. This is the first step. You got to do something with truth. And the Bible says that they suppress the truth. There is a willfulness there. It's in verse 18. Who suppress the the truth and unrighteousness. Listen, if you are determined in your life that you're going to live sinfully, you're going to do what is wrong, then the first thing you're going to try to do is to hold down the truth that says that's wrong. You begin to deny that truth. You often are led by the devil himself to doubt the Word of God. And out of that doubt comes denial. And out of that denial comes disobedience. And out of that disobedience comes disaster. But it starts with what you do with the truth. Can I tell you, we are living in a day in which people simply are saying, there is no truth. Amen. You have your truth, I have my truth, but there is no objective standard for truth. Now there's a word for that, I think, and that word is anarchy. It's where every man and every woman and every young person does what is right in their own eyes. And that's where it starts. And I want to tell you, with all that is within me, this is the hour for the church of Jesus Christ to say, this book is still true. Amen. God's Word is true. And it has never changed. And I believe that it is true from beginning to end. I heard someone say, maybe who was it? But somebody said just recently, said, I believe the Bible from Genesis to the maps. <laughs> you know, and I understood what they were saying. But I believe it is all the inspired Word of God. And I want to ask you, are you suppressing the truth? Maybe I ought to ask it this way. What truth are you suppressing? Because I will tell you, for most of us, when we get to this passage of Scripture that begins with verse number uh, 25 especially, talking about exchanging the truth of God for the lie, and then the vile passions of women with women and men with men, many of us are in our own pridefulness. We're saying, oh yes, preach it preacher. That's people who suppress the truth. But I'm going to tell you, there are truths that the church is suppressing in the world today, not just those outside the church. There are truths of God's Word when it relates to life and when it re relates to money and when it relates to family and when it relates to marriage that we are conveniently overlooking those truths. I, I try to read the Bible through and do by the grace of God on an annual basis and a little more than that. But I want you to understand, one of the things that I can't get away from is God cares about the poor. 
And yet I find many people who conveniently forget that truth. They suppress that truth. Why? Because of the selfishness of our heart that says, I want to take care of me and mine, and I don't care about you, and I don't care about them. And the truth of the matter is we've got to guard against this because this is the slippery slope. This is the slouching toward Gomorrah, the sprinting toward Gomorrah. It begins with people who say, I do not have to live under the authority of God's Word. And I tell you, friend, God's Word is truth. When you look at that particular passage, you get down about verse 19, you talk about sexual immorality. Can I tell you something? God is absolutely opposed to sexual immorality, whether that sexual immorality is between a man and a woman, or two men or two women. Sexual immorality is a sin in the eyes of God. And we suppress those truths. You read on about people who are backbiters. Have there ever been any Baptist backbiters? Well, don't raise your hand. I, I'm not asking you to do that. But I'm telling you, we suppress certain truths. How about those that are wicked in covetousness? Sometimes we just simply make those people heroes, if you will. And haters of God, violent, proud, boasters. I'm not going to go back through all of them except to say this. The Bible says this is where it starts. It starts with an attack on truth itself. And if you'll show me anybody that will at least hold to the authority of this word, I've got something to say to them. But once a person says there is no authority, there's not much that can be said to them at that point that will make much difference in their life. So number one on this process is we suppress the truth. Number two is verse 21. Your Bible's still open. We're walking through this. It says that although they knew God... They did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful. So the first step, we suppress the truth. It's truth. The second truth is, we refuse to glorify God and give Him thanks. i got to tell you, I think in America, one of the greatest sins in America is the, is the sin of ingratitude. Right. Oh my word! If you look at what's happening in the world today, we ought to wake up every morning thanking God that He gave us the grace to be born where we are born and to live in the land of the free and the brave. We ought to start every day recognizing that God is, giver, is the giver of life. Uh, Daniel said to wicked King Belshazzar, You have not glorified God who holds your life's breath in His hands and determines the very course of your life. So when we see people moving away from God, and I'm telling you to check your own heart here, you see people who first of all are selective about the truth. They are not people who are saying, God, I want to know all that you have for me. They're rather people that say, I'll pick and choose what I will believe and what I will do. And that's where it starts, but it immediately moves from that to a refusal to glorify God. Listen, are you giving God due regard? I got to tell you, often that'll be seen in your checkbook. And some of you right now are saying, He's gone to meddling right now. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the Bible teaches us that we ought not to rob God. We ought not to rob God. And the fact of the matter is, we refuse to give Him due regard in our finances, oftentimes in our pleasures, oftentimes in our business, whatever it may be. We are not honoring God. And we're sliding down that slope toward Gomorrah. We suppress the truth. Verse 18. We refuse to glorify God and give Him thanks. Verse 21. Also in verse 21, we claim to be wise. They are futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. Listen, pride. Pride. Can I tell you, the moment you begin to think you know better than God how to live your life, you're living in pride. And pride is still the devil's chief tool. People who claim to be wise. Do you know we have more people in the world today, I think, claiming to be wise, and yet lives are going down the toilet. The fact of the matter is, when we depart from God's Word, 
We don't so much break His Word as our sin and His Word will break our hearts and break our lives. Because that's the way people move away from God. So we refuse to glorify Him and give Him thanks and we claim to be wise. Verse 23, we become idolatrous. Look at verse 23 again and what He says. Change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things and bass boats and nice cars. Whoa, wait, wait a minute. I, I went too far there on that. On that. We tend to think we have, don't have idols. Can I tell you? We live in an idolatrous country among idolatrous people and we fight it in our own lives. But that's what happens when you suppress the truth and you refuse to glorify God and you refuse to give Him thanks and you claim to be wise because we are from our depths worshipers. And either we'll worship the one true God or we'll worship the flesh or we'll worship the world or we'll worship money or whatever it may be or pleasure because we are by nature worshipers and we become idolatrous. Listen to me. Listen to me. This is how nations and people move away from God. By suppressing the truth, refusing to glorify God, refusing to give thanks, claiming to be wise, becoming idolaters, and then in verses 26 through 31, we become debased. Debased. Just move to a lower level of existence. God gave them up to vile passions. Listen to me. This is a frightening word. I believe, uh, I believe it, uh, one commentator uh, said something like this. He listed about five different judgments of God. And you know what one of them was? One was the judgment of abandonment. John MacArthur said that he believed that America right now is under the judgment of God's abandonment. And if that doesn't scare you, it ought to because we can't do without God. And I don't mean that He's not still present. He's an omnipresent God. But I'm simply saying this, my friend, that if we in our lives allow ourselves to become debased, the Scripture says God will give us up to vile passions. God will give us over to a debased mind. God will allow us to go our way. I believe it was uh, C.S. Lewis that said, in the final analysis, Either one of two things will be said. Either you will say to God, Thy will be done. Or God will say to you, Thy will be done. Isn't that a fearful thought? That you can walk away from God if you choose to do so. You can spit in His face and go your own way. And God will let you do so. But my friend, what you will have are consequences. There are consequences to walking away from God. So people who uh, suppress the truth and all the other things I've said become debased in our hearts and lives and God lets us go. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. And it will leave you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. The fact of the matter is, God's commands are for our good. He gives us His Word because He wants to bless us, not because He wants to curse us. So we suppress the truth, verse 18. We refuse to glorify God and give Him thanks, verse 21. We claim to be wise, verse 21. We become idolatrous, verse 23. We become debased, verses 26 to 31. Now, look back at verse 32. And I'm asking you, is this America, the, the country in which we live, that I was born in on the 2nd of November, 1948, is this America? Who? knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And it's not an improper translation to, to say they applaud. Can I ask you a question? What is being applauded among the cultural elite in America today? The answer is sin. Shameful sin is being applauded. And those who would say otherwise are finding themselves castigated by a majority of people who want to say anything goes. 
And yet the fact of the matter is, this is the road to, the, to Gomorrah. When we get to the point that we not only approve evil and practice it, we applaud it. And I've lived long enough to see that. Things that were so universally disapproved because of the Word of God are now not only approved, they are applauded. They're the ones that get the magazine covers. They're the ones that gets the call from high-ranking officials because we live in that kind of culture that is sprinting toward the morrow. And somebody might say, Brother Hosey, is this a big deal? And i got to tell you, it's a huge deal. When we begin individually and when we begin as a church to go away from God, God's wrath is upon those who take that path. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not saying that any child of God will ever experience that wrath of God in that final day. But what I am saying is, God still stands squarely and firmly against sin wherever it rears its ugly head. Why? Because it hurts His children. It hurts His children. I, I think it was Philip Yancey who in his last book said he had come to believe that the entire message of the Bible could be summed up in this sentence. God wants His family back. I like that. God wants His family back. God wants good for you. He doesn't want evil. God wants you to be blessed, not to be cursed. And yet God does abandon those. Indeed, He calls people fools who take that path that leads away from Him. So, do we have problems? We've got problems. Are they big? They are big. Are they ugly? They are ugly. Is there hope? And here is where I want to end. Because even though Paul in chapters 1, 2, and 3 speaks so plainly to say, you have, we have, I have a problem. Yet it bookended with that is a simple, simple truth. Bible handy. I haven't read this yet, but I want you to go back to chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Now listen, or read along in your Bible. Here's what he said. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now listen to me. Before he ever said to them, we have a problem. He told them about the solution. He told them that this problem that he's going to tell them about has already been solved. It's already been solved. And that's what he means when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. But then I want you to turn to chapter 5. Chapter 5. On the other side of these chapters that paint a bleak and dark picture of the culture in that day. In chapter 5, look at verse 6. Oh, I like this. For while we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely, for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. Verse 8, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is there hope for my life? Is there hope for your life? Is there hope for America? Yes, but our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Right. And He is the hope of the world. He is the hope. And this pattern that's here, listen to me, it's not too late. It's not too late for me. It's not too late for you. And I stand before you to say, it's not too late for America. It's our time to stand and say that in Christ, there is a remedy to the problem. And there's only one remedy. Can I tell you, I'm already tired of the election and it's not till next year. Everybody with me? I got any amens on that? I mean, I really am. And I'm tired of people candidates who are coming out and saying many times things that I don't believe in their heart they believe at all, but the poll takers have said that they're going to have to say if they're going to get elected. But can I tell you, there will be no salvation. 
There will be no redirection for America because of any candidate of any party. The only one who holds the hope of America is Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And that means, listen to me, that means that we who are the people of God have an eternally important message. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that gospel of Jesus Christ eternally declares problem solved. Problem solved. What do we have to do? If we want to change the direction of our life and our land, we embrace the gospel, we live the gospel, and we share the gospel. We embrace it. But listen to me, if all you did was 40 years ago pray to prayer, that's not what salvation's meant to be. You are to live the gospel. Can I tell you, I need the gospel as much today as I ever did in my life. I need to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to myself. Because Jesus came not only to give me pardon, Jesus came to give me power over the works of the devil. And that's what we need in this life. So I've got to embrace the gospel. I've got to live the gospel. And then always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within me. I've got to share the gospel. You say, is that important? It's the only hope we have. Yeah. It's the only hope we have. And so this could be the church's finest hour. But not if the lambs are silent. <laughs> We're going to have to be bold in the right way. With love, with gentleness, but nonetheless to say and say clearly, there is one way and it's Jesus Christ. There is one truth, it's Jesus Christ. There is one life, it's Jesus Christ. And to be able to say that Jesus still forgives sin. And to be able to say that there is hope not only for this life, but for the life to come. And that hope is in Jesus Christ. The message, the gospel message, the gospel of Christ eternally declares problem solved. When Jesus died on the cross, when they buried Him in the borrowed tomb, when He was raised from the dead on the third day, I'm telling you what, friend, it was finished. God had solved humankind's problem. So we've got to embrace it. We've got to live it. And we've got to share it.